So this, uh, this kind of 30 minute talk is aimed at those who are relatively new to the world of kind of data science, data analytics, machine learning, or, or even PyData, maybe you're a machine learning expert, but not in PyData. So I'm really excited um, about uh, sort of where data science has come from, where it's going, uh, the applications of it, and I would like to spend uh, the rest of the talk just sharing some of that with you. So first of all, what is data science? I think it's a very misunderstood or vague, uh, slightly buzzwordy term, but it is, for me, a real thing. It's a useful term. Uh, but a few of the sort of uh, maybe uh, entertaining answers, maybe it's just a statistician who lives in San Francisco. Uh, is there anyone from the ONS here? No, oh, not brave enough to come, or not brave enough to put their hands up. Um, yeah, I get this kind of um, response sometimes from people who are uh, traditional statisticians, and to be honest, data science is kind of traditional statistics, but just with a twist, uh, sometimes. Uh, I definitely think it's not just statistics on a Mac. I am a Mac user, but it can be done on any platform. That's the delight, especially of the Python and data data system. I think this is getting close to it. Someone who's better at statistics than any software engineer, better at software engineering than any statistician. And it's definitely true. It's suddenly this word for a job role that describes, it doesn't quite fit into existing uh, roles. So here's, here's my elongated definition. It's, I think it's a very useful set of tools and techniques. It's not a buzzword, and it's about doing useful work, extracting useful information from the data. Uh, but it's about the tools and techniques that we do to use that. And those tools and techniques change over time. It's very interdisciplinary. Um, I asked you uh, sort of your job roles, and, and you do have this kind of bouncing around between working with the CEO one day, working with the developer team another day, working with the sales and the marketing team another day. And also, I didn't ask you what industries uh, you work in, partly because I know the answer will be coming up on the screen shortly because you've filled in that information on our meetup page. Uh, but it is massively cross-sector. When people say to me as a consultant, what industry do you work in? And I'm like, that doesn't make sense. It's like asking Excel, what industry does it specialize in? This is a really useful set of tools for doing really useful work in so many different domains. And I find that fascinating. Uh, I think it's also science. You can't really have data science without science. So it's all very well and good to do uh, some incredible data mining to figure out what sort of uh, customers are more likely to convert on your system or more likely to churn, but that's just data mining. Until you actually run some kind of test to prove that that relationship is true, then you're not really proving anything yet. You're just saying, well, there's a relationship here. Um, and, and anyone that's uh, seen the sort of uh, causality versus correlation fallacy, uh, or seen uh, websites like spuriouscorrelations.com that just say, these are all things that correlate. Uh, it's things like how much cheese is eaten per capita in the United States versus uh, the films that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is in. Like these things, there's no reason for them to correlate, but sometimes in business, it's too easy to say that yes, all of my team, I hired five extra people this, uh, this year, and uh, suddenly our sales are going up as well. Like you've got to do the science sometimes to prove that things that correlate are also causal. Uh, this is my favorite definition though, of data science itself. This is by uh, a chap in the uh, US called Drew Conway, and this is a data science friend I've got. Hands up if you've seen this before. Cool. Um, so this is familiar to some of you. This is uh, like this kind of definition in terms of skills uh, that might be required. And so it talks about hacking skills. There. This is a lot of people sometimes see this and think, is that like hacking, like cybersecurity hacking? It's not hacking. It's uh, more an approach to software development. So that maybe should just say engineering or software engineering skills. But I think hacking is a nice word for it because it's more about getting something done very quickly. If I'm going to uh, try and analyze a problem, and build a model, then I might want to kind of do five hours of work to get a rough answer is, is this actually going to lead somewhere or not? Uh, rather than spend a month planning this out and doing all the due diligence and doing it properly uh, and making sure that my code is robust and resilient and tested, if I'm going to find out in five hours of my of time uh, that actually this entire problem is completely pointless to try and solve with data uh, because of some unforeseen uh, relationship or maybe there's issues with the data itself, uh, then I'd like to know that sooner rather than later, and then in five hours' time I could do something else. So it's sort of kind of like when you hack together a chair with a wall from Ikea. That's what I mean by hacking there. It's, it's an approach that focuses on doing a lot with a very short amount of time and being lean and efficient in how you work. Blending that with maths and statistics, uh, kind of background and expertise. So this is, to me, statistics is the science of knowing what is true in data. And that seems like a really useful thing if you're trying to prove certain insights exist in your data, extract information from data. 
But as we blend that with the programming skills, we can start to move a lot further and a lot faster. We can start to automate all of our little, very unique, bespoke ways of working. And uh, we can also take advantage of everyone else's little, tiny uh, productivity automations. And at some point, they get called libraries. And we can start to take use of some library that someone started writing 10 years ago, and it's used by a load of other people. So the world of software engineering is really useful for doing statistics. Uh, but statistics doesn't require software engineering to be useful. Like I learned statistics using a pencil and paper. And uh, you can do very useful work um, using pencil and paper or using non-software engineering approaches. Um, if, if anyone's ever used tools like SPSS or even just like Tableau, you don't need to learn to become a programmer to use these tools and to extract insights. Uh, but as you kind of blend all of these together, you get to the world of data science. I think machine learning is interesting where it is because that's kind of like you're blending the stats, you're using the, the, the coding, but you're not necessarily combining it with domain expertise. And that's because uh, I don't know if anybody's done a Kaggle competition where you don't actually know what any of the data points mean. It's just like data point one, data point two, data point three predicts data point four. And you can throw that a machine learning algorithm, and it can learn to solve those problems extremely well without actually knowing what those data points mean or even what industry it's from. Uh, so machine learning is useful, but as you can start teaching the algorithm yourself and guiding it where to look and adding more data in, using your own personal expertise in whatever domain you work in, then again you start to move, in my view, towards data science. And you can teach that machine to solve things further and faster. So it's also a rapidly growing field. Some of the early adopters in data science, companies like Netflix, some predict what movie you would like to watch next. Uh, Amazon, uh, people who viewed this also viewed it as one of the most simple recommendation systems. Um, Facebook, of course, is doing all kinds of crazy engineering. Google, Google Search has been one of the biggest um, applications of sort of machine learning and uh, sort of data engineering uh, in just Google Search. There's amazing power and technology behind that. There's also um, the world of, of politics. Um, so there's things like 538, uh, the data blog in the US, thoroughly, thoroughly recommended um, if, if you haven't seen that before. Um, also, I've put the 2012 Barack Obama campaign. So I think this is one of the first campaigns where they really got to the world of micro-targeting. So for every single person in an entire country, at a citizen level, can we predict how likely are you to register to vote? And if you did register to vote, who would you register for? Now that's useful in terms of being able to target you and say, well, you're unlikely to vote for my person, and you're unlikely to register to vote. Actually, maybe I should save my adults. If you're going to vote for the other person anyway, I'll just leave you unregistered. I'll let you not vote uh, and save myself some money. Um, maybe if we know that you would vote for a guy, but you're also not likely to register, then in that case, I could send you some advertising and try and talk about that. Or maybe because we're doing this for every single person in the entire country, uh, I can combine that with some psychological um, techniques and I can send a little leaflet to every single person in your street and say, hey, Paul Mikel here, he votes, he, he's, he likes our guy, he's just not registered to vote. So we'll use uh, peer pressure and psychological profiling and, uh, and, and sort of uh, slightly creepy machine learning techniques uh, to tell everyone else that you, you live near that you're not going to register to vote. So, so just imagine what they were doing last year, there's, there's a fun fact. So where does data science come from? Um, I, I kind of meet people uh, who are kind of not really maybe in this world so much, and I'm like, what is a data science? It's really like, is it, it's surely it's just like a software engineer doing some data work, or it's just a business analyst, or all these other things. And I've begun to touch on that, especially with that Venn diagram, but what has it changed? For people that have been working in this field for decades, why have we now suddenly decided to invent the phrase data science for people? So I'd like to just cover what's actually happened to maybe facilitate this. First of all, 2007. There's a lot of things that I think changed in 2007. Uh, the iPhone was released, Android launched, Facebook and Twitter um, were either launched at South by Southwest or beginning to really take off. Uh, the Kindle launched, we've got a bit of an information revolution going on. Uh, IBM Watson was created, the Watson project now available to anyone via an API call. Uh, but even just a few years later, it kind of became a little bit famous when it won the Jeopardy TV game show using some really cool natural language processing techniques. And uh, for anybody interested in NLP, we've got to talk on that in about uh, 30 minutes time. Uh, you've also got the open source ecosystem beginning to really, really take off. Um, so you've got GitHub uh, was, was kind of uh, launched, I think, in 2007. And you've got tools like Linux uh, becoming much more mainstream than they were in the previous 10 years. 
You've got some pretty big changes in the open source data analytics tool uh, area as well. So uh, R was great as a tool for many, many years, but um, I wasn't allowed to use it officially at Apple uh, in, in, uh, even, even when I was there in 2010 because it was open source. Um, but suddenly, uh, not in 2007, this was a little bit later, this is more like 2011, 12, uh, Microsoft bought one of the biggest R vendors, they bought Revolution Analytics. And suddenly you're allowed to get R from the Microsoft distribution instead of going by these shady open source downloads uh, links. Similarly with Python, uh, some of or many of you probably know about the Anaconda Python distribution. But being able to download your Python binary and your Python libraries uh, from this uh, commercially enterprise friendly company that isn't, again, the wild west of open source software, because there's nothing in IT. Uh, enterprise IT team likes more than open source software. Um, suddenly, Anaconda makes this possible. And it means that nowadays uh, you've got this enormous array of companies using these uh, these languages and the libraries and the ecosystems around them. Where you just ten years ago didn't have access to that. Python and R existed, but you can use it in your job. Uh, other things happened in 2007 as well. Hadoop uh, project uh, was also started ten years ago. Uh, and, and this is sort of a, a way for storing data, uh, not on just my machine, but let's take some of my data and put it on your machine. Put some on your machine and put some on your machine. And then we'll have one machine that just remembers where all the data lives. And then when you come to Mr. Hadoop master node and you say, hey, where were my photos from 2008? It'll know, because it's got a really good memory. It'll say, okay, there's some here, there's some here, some here. It'll get all of those and give them back to you. That's all it is. It's just a very smart filing system for data storage. But it suddenly enables this whole new way of working. Um, and if you're interested in a lot of big data, um, definitely talk to who's here from the big data Bristol meetup group. Uh, so there's Mike, uh, Michael back there. Uh, we'll do a shout out for that later. But this is not to talk about big data, this is to talk about data science. So um, other things have happened in the last maybe decade or so. Uh, in 2011, only two days, we were creating more information than we did up until 2003 combined. So all the data created, this is a little bit hand I think, but it's an estimate, uh, up until 2003 was two exabytes. Uh, that's two billion gigabytes if you were to take all the spoken words and written words and so on. And then 2011, that's every two days the world is creating two exabytes. And here's a uh, hand wavy uh, estimates from the IDC of exabytes created annually across the world per year. So 2011 is here. You see this wonderful uh, shaped graph similar to the Pi Data membership. Uh, so where's that going? Suddenly in 2014, uh, this is 2009, we've had to rescale this from exabytes uh, back to zettabytes now. This is another thousand uh, more. So we're beginning, we're continuing to go, and that's not a linear trend. So 2016, uh, we're, we're currently hitting about 40 to 10 compounds uh, growth, and 10 zettabytes finally being created. And the forecasts are gonna hit about 45 zettabytes by 2020. So this is another reason why suddenly people like the idea of data scientists. If you're able to handle and process data, there's so much of it out there being created by so many different systems, not just sort of the customer um, ERP systems or the CRM systems that you might be working with, but just consider something as simple as a jet engine. Uh, so this world of sensor data is exploding. And I uh, know some of you from a, an engineering background, and you're definitely know it's true, the amount of data you're dealing with from maybe uh, all the sensors within, within a single engine, that's 20 terabytes every hour of information being generated by two engines, by a six hour flight, by 30,000 planes in the sky, uh, over a whole year, we're talking what's this like three, uh, three billion terabytes uh, from just plain flight jet engines alone. That begins to give you uh, an idea of where are, where's all this data coming from. Uh, every 60 seconds, just the world of social media. Um, I mean, these days people love social media because it's really big. Um, I don't know how many people are dealing with, um, say, 11 million rows of data every 60 seconds. Uh, but that's, that's what Apple is dealing with, with iMessage, for example. So big data, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a really useful set of tools and techniques. In the same way that I see data science in terms of what are the tools that enable us to do data science, uh, big data as well is not a hand waving thing. It is a really useful thing. If you have big data, it's really, really difficult. You have to work in whole new ways. Um, and so there is a really nice ecosystem uh, to help you deal with that. But a quick cautionary tale. Um, from one of my favorite uh, applications of, of data science, which was the world of politics. In 1936, you had the US presidential election, you had uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt competing against Al Landon for the presidency. And uh, the Literary Digest ran a massive poll. Uh, they surveyed 
uh, something like uh, one quarter of the entire electorate of the United States uh, through uh, phone calls. They phoned everyone who had a phone in the entire country. And they also polled the entire membership. And they came out with a really strong prediction that this man the right, Mr. Alfred Landon, would win with 57% of the vote. So that's a strong, strong prediction. That's a strong win. That's a landslide. And yet, what happened is uh, Roosevelt won all of the states in blue. Uh, so Roosevelt actually won 62% um, of the vote. So we've gone from 57% prediction for London to down to 38% in reality. That's a pretty big error. And um, I think if I ever predicted that for one of my clients, I would probably get fired pretty quickly. Uh, so why did they do this? At the end of the day, data science is statistics. Using just more data is not better data. And uh, there was a young upstart at the time called Mr. George Gallup, who was kind of like the Nate Silver of his day, and he used good statistical practice. He stopped around on people on street corners, asked them who you think you're voting for, and got their answers, and then uh, correctly calibrated and adjusted for that. And he pretty much smashed this answer. He called this very accurately. Uh, whereas, think about what the literary digests were doing. Every single person with a telephone in the entire country, uh, that's like the richest 25% of the electorate that they contacted and polled. And the richest were going to vote 57% for Landon, but the other 75% of the country uh, preferred Mr. Roosevelt. So more data isn't better data, and good statistical practice still applies even when you have uh, terrifying quantities of information to deal with. So some of the other applications of this world, data science machine learning, we've got search engines, recommendation systems, uh, image recognition, uh, facial recognition, speech recognition, things like Siri uh, on, on, on your Amazon Alexa, all using uh, machine learning uh, teams to come up with these tools. Uh, in the world of gaming, in the world of price comparison, the same tools that you use for price comparison, uh, the websites are also using price optimization. The same tools that you use, uh, that Google Maps uses to route you from A to B. Uh, the same kind of algorithms that will be used for uh, figuring out what's the quickest route from A to B across the social network, and therefore how can we find maybe the influencers at key positions in that network and bring them on board to uh, emphasize virality within, within our products. Uh, things like fraud detection, risk detection, uh, logistics, again, the same sort of category uh, uh, of algorithms that delivers your goods, uh, helps to deliver data around uh, road networks or data networks. And then kind of looking to the future, or looking to the or current, I guess, self-driving cars, robots, AI systems. There's a lot of this in the news at the moment, the idea of the robot revolution. And uh, ultimately, this is the sort of industry, the sector that's going to be at the heart of it. So what is machine learning? Um, this is very much uh, this sector uh, of, of our friendly Venn diagram. So uh, people say, is it AI when we talk about AI powered systems? And I'm like, well, if it's talking about machine learning, it's technically a branch or a subset of AI. So it's kind of related to AI, um, but there's a lot more to AI than machine learning. And it's about systems that can learn from data. Can we learn to solve a problem? Can we learn to actually figure out who's going to be a risk if we give them a loan? Uh, and, and, uh, and solve the problem, but also as we get more data, as every year goes past, we learn to solve it better and better and better. And there's two words here, representation and generalization. One is extracting structure from data. For example, I can extract structure from this room by just looking at maybe classifying that maybe there's two different types of person in the room uh, by gender or by age, or there's various structures uh, just that I can look at. There's no prediction problem, just is there structure. There's also generalization, which is making predictions. Uh, two other words for this uh, is supervised learning, unsupervised learning problem. So let's dig into that more. Supervised can be as simple as you've got an X, you've got a Y, you see there's a relationship when X is high, Y is high, when X is low, Y is low, and we can say, let's build a model. There's some kind of model that might look like a line of best fit, uh, but it's just a very simple algebraic relationship. But that is what supervised learning is. It's just making predictions using some simplified model of reality. Unsupervised learning is more about extracting structures. So say you just have the heights of everyone in the room, and then we just visualized it in the right way, then maybe you can see there's different types of people in the room. If this was a school, I could say maybe there's some tall, um, kind of uh, strict people, and there's some small, noisy people in this school, and say there's uh, more structure around that, like children and adults. But at the end of the day, it is just finding structure. Now, if you give all this data to an unsupervised algorithm, it should be able to do this automatically. So two types of data, continuous data, uh, things like your height, your weight, and qualitative data, or categorical data, things like eye color. So we can split the uh, sort of two domains, supervised and unsupervised, by these uh, two data types, and we can come up with the four what I call worlds of machine learning. So first up, we have regression. This is about supervised problems. We're predicting something. Uh, given a load of other things, can we predict something? The thing we're predicting is a continuous variable. 
That's what makes it regression. So, for example, at Apple, uh, one of the problems I, I was given was can we predict how many iPhones will sell in India next year? We don't sell in India, but you've got all of the sales data for every country for every year. So can you take other data variables that we do know about in India and predict how many will sell? And because we're taking uh, some variables, it doesn't matter what those variables are, but because what we're predicting is a continuous number, how many will sell, that makes it a regression problem. And we can then use regression uh, algorithms or solutions to solve that. Uh, next up, classification. So supervised, we're predicting something. What we're predicting is a category, A, B, C, red, blue, green. Or it's a binary category, like yes or no. Anything with a yes or no question, you can throw a classifier at. So in this case, uh, your spam classifier uh, in, in your email is a great example because it's looking at various um, uh, parts of the email. Maybe it knows that uh, one in 10 emails are spam. So we'll start off with this initial guess, 10% chance of being spam. And then we'll see certain keywords, uh, all natural, bargain, guaranteed. And uh, it'll start notching up the probability of being spam. Uh, maybe it sees that it says, hey, John, and so it'll notch it down a bit because maybe they know who I am. Uh, but at the end of the day, it'll say, right, this is a 60% uh, chance of being spam, put it in the spam file, give me the next email. So because it's taking data and it's trying to predict a yes or no answer, that makes it a classifier problem. We can use classifier algorithms to solve the classifier problem. Next up, unsupervised. So the world of clustering is about finding uh, hidden structures, or maybe not so hidden structures. But in this case, uh, this is an example about user location. So maybe we've got a load of mobile phone data from people moving around cities, and we want to know, is there a hidden structure in this? Now I look at this and I say, it looks like a fairly homogenous group of users that we've got. It looks like one big town, but if we visualize it in the correct way, uh, we add our latitude as well, then suddenly we realize there's three different clusters of users in this, and if you throw this at clustering algorithm, it will automatically pick up, yeah, there's definitely three different clusters here. Uh, let's call them towns, one, two, three, red, green, blue. Uh, but in reality, you might be using this for, uh, let's take all of our user behavioral data as people move around our website, and try and figure out are there different categories of users that we can automatically infer from just the data alone. We're not trying to predict anything here. We just want to know are there natural groupings within the data and what might those be. So because we're reducing maybe uh, 400 columns of data, uh, one row per user, into one column of data, which is categorical of um, town A, town B, town C, that's what makes it a clustering problem because we're reducing all that information down to a categorical variable. Finally, uh, you have the world of dimensional reduction. Uh, so this is unsupervised in that we're trying to find uh, hidden patterns, uh, but we're taking those 100 <coughs> columns of information, we're reducing it down to something, but that something is a continuous variable, it's a number, somewhere on a number line. So instead of adding one new column that is a category, it's a number, and that's what makes it dimensional reduction. And this is usually often about, can we find where's the signal amongst a load of noise? So in the case of a stock, market, when someone says to me, how did the FTSE 100 do yesterday, I'm not going to go through all the 100 companies in, in the FTSE stock exchange and say, well, this one went up, this one went down. That's too much information for you. What I will say is the FTSE 100, which is a weighted average of all the other 100 companies, uh, was down 2%. And that's probably enough for you to know. So that sort of core signal of FTSE 100 uh, is a really useful thing for humans. It's also a really useful thing for many algorithms. So you have to take all that information and say, give me the core signal. That's a very simple example of a dimensional reduction um, solution. Just a weighted average. So, some tips for success. Um, in terms of if you are wanting to get into this world, or maybe you want to progress further in, into this world, um, some sort of core qualities and skills uh, that you might want to be looking at is things like first of all, technical ability. I think is uh, I think people know this is true. Like having some uh, knowledge of how to program or statistics or maths and understanding how to put systems together or deploy systems, um, this is all very well and good. Uh, what I think is, is less focused upon is the sort of softer skill set. Uh, so these are the kind of qualities that I look at when I'm hiring people. Like, do you have a really strong uh, statistical rigor? Are you curious? How do you communicate? Uh, so for example, curiosity, that is useful in so many different ways. It's not just about um, going at someone who can go out and find the patterns, or it's not just someone who says, hey, that outline looks funny, let's just discard it. Like, I don't want them to just discard it and move on. Maybe that's indicative of a much bigger problem with how our data is being collected. And also, curiosity also means that this is a field that is moving so quickly. Uh, to stay up to date with it, you have to stay curious, you have to keep on learning. You have to keep on coming back to PyDesa meetups to find out what's new. Rigor is also a fun one. Uh, humans are really hard to see patterns, see things that are not actually there. 
Uh, that is just a washing machine, but you see more. Uh, also, people give more weight to information to confirm your beliefs. If you think that something is likely to be true, like I think your lush sells really good beer, uh, I'm more likely to uh, want to believe that in the face of information that tells me otherwise. Uh, and it's not just you that has to watch out for that. Uh, as sort of uh, the data analyst or data scientists within your organization, you're probably also the vanguard of other people uh, falling foul of these cognitive biases. So being able to apply good rigor uh, to how data is analyzed within your organization and to your own anal analyses is really, really useful. Um, I think rigor is hard. It's, it's kind of seems, yeah, of course I'm rigorous, but no, it's really, really hard to do this well. Uh, so here's another little story about, um, uh, this is Michael David Hamble. Uh, in the Second World War, he was tasked to find out where we add additional plating, steel plating, to our bombers so they don't keep on falling out of the sky into the English Channel. And uh, they drew up a really nice little visualization, this is World War II era visualization, of where all the bombs had sustained damage. And uh, a lot of the people were looking at this were saying, yeah, well, obviously, we're going to add armor plating up here, on the wings, and in the center. And he said, no, 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 you've got to be rigorous here. You've got to completely upside down. What you want to do is add armor platings everywhere where there is not a dot, because the dots represent all the places where a plane can get hit and make it back and land so that you can put a dot on that place. All the planes <laughs> that got hit on the cockpit and on the engines and this part of the fuselage and where the fuel is, uh, those are the planes at the bottom of the channel right now. And it's so easy to get these things wrong, just to kind of plow without really thinking about it. I'm just constantly asking myself, what am I missing? What am I missing? Am I doing this way? Communication skills is another, another kind of really important quality because not everybody understands a hypothesis test or a p-value. Uh, and also, if you want to convince someone who's very skeptical about what data can really do for their organization, that they should listen to you, first of all, you need to listen to them, you need to explain things clearly, and you probably need to persuade them to tell a story about why you might be correct, why your analysis should be believed. Uh, business acumen. So this is more about um, kind of knowing what's worth doing. Uh, you can data mine a data set to death, or you might be able to find interesting answers much faster if you know what's useful, what the business needs from you. Data has so much potential to tell you interesting things, and so much more potential to tell you uninteresting things. So being able to focus your own time is really useful. Or being able to work using your communication skills with other people who can guide you. Uh, this is the most important stuff to be focusing. Now, if you are looking at a uh, data science potential uh, job, uh, job path or career path, uh, there is huge amounts of potential. Um, in terms of the, the ranking, it's jumping up like 65 places a year on, on job ranking lists. Um, more and more companies across the spectrum uh, are looking for these skill sets and finding it really hard to find people, especially in Bristol. Um, I mean, the reason that OVO are incredibly generous in, in uh, hosting us today um, is, is partly because they're really keen to find good people uh, with these skills. And, um, there's also a lot of uh, shortage in terms of people with leadership experience. So maybe uh, you're coming here today from a completely different sector, but thinking, hey, like I know a lot about my sector, I know a lot about project management or personnel management. Um, maybe you can skill up with just enough information that you can actually move into a data science role, uh, but you will give something from your own current experience that other people who are just starting out or just graduating from university may not have. So, so keep that in mind. Um, as I said, these slides will be online, um, but in terms of kind of good books to get stuck into, uh, these are a few of my favourites. The Elements of Statistical Learning is probably uh, the best, uh, although I think it's all in R, uh, but there's loads of people that go through it and, and turn it all into Python. Uh, so there's Python uh, GitHub versions of this book as well. Uh, my favourite free book, though, is uh, on the left, uh, a real deep dive into inferential statistics. I think this is ignored too much in sort of machine learning courses. Actually understanding what's the correct uh, non-parametric test to use in certain use cases and so on. Uh, Python for Data Analysis uh, by Wes McKinney. Hands up who's heard of Wes McKinney. He's like a little bit of a celebrity in the PyDays world. This is basically the Pandas book. So if you're here tonight and you think, oh, Pandas, what is that? How do I learn? It? Buy the book. And then finally, uh, one of the best books I know on how to communicate and write uh, very clearly in uh, when you're doing technical communication. There's a lot of online courses uh, you can get stuck into in terms of learning these from scratch. Uh, there's a lot of podcasts. Uh, I am a podcast junkie. So uh, I've given on slides uh, all of my top uh, favorite data podcasts. Finally, I'm going to give you a very quick overview of the PyDays ecosystem uh, because this is why we're here tonight. 
Uh, so why Python? Uh, first of all, because every kid is learning Python at the moment. If you don't learn it sooner or later, then we're going to be automated by these tiny people coming up through the education system. Um, I think Python used to be a bit of a toy language, or considered a toy language. It's definitely not a toy language. If it can power a billion people on Instagram, it can power your website. If it can power YouTube and all of the analytics YouTube is doing. But also, you've got so many other companies. If it's good enough for NASA, yeah, it's probably good enough for you. Um, so make sure to play it all. Um, they, as, as, as Mikhail said, have a huge array of upcoming events. Uh, this is just this year alone around the world. Not all in Python, like JuliaCon, uh, for example. Um, meetups, they're no, actually everywhere. Uh, there's a load of uh, downloads and sponsored projects. So this is a really good starting point to go to the downloads page, and you'll see all of the current uh, tools in what we call the PyData stack. Uh, for example, things like Pandas for your data manipulation, <laughs> things like Scikit-Learn, machine learning, uh, and more. So these are the ones I would start with. Um, and these are probably the three that I use more than anything else. Uh, Jupyter Notebook is something that you'll see again and again in the world of PyData and in these kind of meetups uh, as a very quick demo. Uh, here is one I made earlier. This is the uh, Bristol PyData Bristol Member Analysis Notebook. So a notebook is just a way of doing Python work, but it is in a browser. It is interactive in terms of its code, so I can come into here, I can uh, edit this, I can run this as code. But I also can annotate as if it was almost a mouse of Word document uh, using, in this case, uh, markdown formatting. So you can do all of your analyses, you can save them as a notebook format, you can write up and document and write your conclusions into them, then you can send them on their way to everyone else in your team. Or if you need to send it to the CEO, you can export it as a PDF document and send it to the CEO. So a really nice tool for doing this kind of work. Um, this will be, uh, again, uh, shared. There's all sorts of interesting numbers that we crunched about how you answered a survey. Um, for example, 80% um, of Python experiences for users using Python 3 uh, uh, versus Python 2. So I'm really excited that you guys are definitely on the right track uh, in terms of how you're using Python. Uh, this is definitely the way that things are going. But just being able to get this data out in like a real short amount of my time to get to the using the PyDate ecosystem of tools. Then we have to present the results in a nice PyDate notebook. Um, for me, I love it as a way of working and uh, thoroughly recommend it. Uh, so here's that slide. Here's another one. Um, we are paying attention in terms of what you've said in terms of your topics. So um, this is what you can expect from PyData Bristol in terms of some of the topics we'll be covering. Uh, this is what you've requested. Um, but also, if you're thinking, ha, huh, I really want to do a talk. I want to come to you guys and offer a talk. Use this to inspire you as well. So this will also be on the slides or be on my GitHub. Final thoughts. Um, data science and data analytics are often, um, I think there's not really much distinction between the two. Uh, I have to work hard to even separate what I think goes into each column here. Um, I think in terms of when someone says, yeah, I do a lot of data science, but I'm, my role is data analyst, or vice versa, I don't think there's a clear answer to that question other than using this Venn diagram. If you are a data analyst in terms of your job title, and you're programming, and you're using statistics, and you're applying it, and you're doing machine learning, you should probably be a data scientist, and if your job title is a data scientist, but you're not doing any programming or machine learning or stats application, you're not really applying it to anywhere, then maybe you should be a data analyst and everything between is shades of grey. It's not a useful answer, it's mostly a correct answer. Uh, for me, data science, I communicate, I am a data science consultant. And uh, really, I think there's a lot more to it than just these things. And I think, um, if you think about how far we've come in the last 10 years, um, and how much easier it is to do all of this stuff versus 10 years ago, maybe you need a whole team of five people to do it. Um, I think in another 10 years, like one person can easily do uh, everything that is currently um, on this slide because all of the tools, I don't think it's hard at the moment, I don't think it seems like a lot of work, but it takes a month. Uh, just assume in five, ten years' time, it'll take a few hours. Jobs. And I think we'll get to this point. So, it's definitely um, stay up to date, uh, get lots of experience. Uh, if you're just getting into the field, then uh, these are my kind of top tips of what to look for, what to, uh, what to focus on. Especially the bottom one, side projects. Um, how do you understand what can you do to get side projects? First of all, there is the meetups. Now, London is great, it has meetups. Bristol is also great and has loads of meetups. So, explore the scene, find out what else is out there, and meet a load of people, get inspired. If you want to do some side projects for you have a weekend, then have a look at the hackathons, the data diets that are out there, especially the local organization, Path Hacks. Um, their, their philosophy is we liberate data, we make useful things. Um, Hack on to one of my favorite ways of learning and uh, experimenting and practicing uh, what I do. If you do nothing else, uh, remember this XKCD graphic, which is one weekend messing around with some new library is probably going to be incredibly useful to your future career at some point. But really, if you do nothing else, get started tonight. Um, download a podcast. Uh, Dave Sketch, I think, is brilliant. He just spends like 
for the 15 minute episode, just going through one topic at a time. Um, realize that AI, machine learning, data science, this is a really interesting field to be in, uh, to skill up in. Uh, it's also potentially a very scary future, so there's a lot of conversations we said about ethics and so on. I'd love to have uh, people doing uh, talks about that in the future here. Um, final thoughts, it's a product of our time. Data scientists weren't around 10 years ago. Uh, I don't know what will be around in 10 years' time. Um, it's a skill set that requires technical and people skills, and honestly, we're only getting started. Thank you very much.